Muy bien. Vamos a continuar con nuestra tercera sesión, crecimiento y ciclo económico, con el tema ciclos económicos y crisis financieras, un análisis a largo plazo, con el doctor Edward Prescott, Premio Nobel de Economía 2004. También quiero saludar a quienes nos acompañan en esta sesión, el doctor Santiago Montenegro, presidente de Asofondos, doctor Juan Carlos Echeverri, ministro de Hacienda y Crédito Público de Colombia, los comentarios a cargo del doctor Roberto Junguito, presidente de Pasecolda, y el doctor Rudolf Holmes, exministro de Hacienda. Invito en este momento al señor gerente de investigaciones económicas de Corfi Colombiana, el doctor Andrés Pardo, quien hará la introducción oficial del doctor Edward Prescott. Buenas tardes. Eh, como ya es costumbre, Corfi Colombiana eh, sigue eh, auspiciando eh, la venida de algunos conferencistas de, de talla mundial, eh, porque pues consideramos que eh, el análisis económico hace, una parte, hace parte integral de todo lo que es el análisis eh, de mercados. Eh, en esta ocasión pues tenemos el gusto de, de auspiciar la, la venida del profesor Edward Prescott. El profesor Prescott, pues como ya todos saben, ganó el Premio Nobel de Economía en el 2004. Eh, actualmente es consultor eh, en, la, en el Banco de la Reserva Federal en Minneapolis y trabaja como profesor en la Universidad de, de Arizona. Eh, la pregunta que todo el mundo me ha hecho es, se ganó el premio Nobel, pero ¿en qué consiste lo que, lo que, lo que ganó? Eh, brevemente, eh, básicamente dos papers principales. El primero tiene que ver con las eh, consistencias en política económica, en la cual básicamente con el profesor Kitland eh, lo que trataban de demostrar o lo que lograron a demostrar es que eh, las políticas económicas que se toman en un momento determinado del tiempo eh, posiblemente pueden tener unas consecuencias hacia el futuro que crean unos, uh, unos resultados que no necesariamente son, uh, son óptimos. Eh, el paper se llamaba reglas en vez, de, en vez de discreción y básicamente lo que decía era que cuando la política no económica entra a temas de discreción y no están siguiendo unas reglas que están establecidas, se pueden llegar a, 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 estos, a estos resultados que no necesariamente son óptimos en la política económica. Eh, y el segundo tiene que ver con los ciclos económicos. Eh, básicamente, eh, el, el profesor Prescott y el profesor Kidland sentaron las bases eh, para, para el análisis de ciclos económicos, eh, en donde lo que demostraron era que choques de oferta eh, y cambios tecnológicos pueden crear... Unas, unos cambios en el corto plazo sobre el ciclo de crecimiento económico a, a, distinto al ciclo de la tendencia, perdón, de, de, distinto a la tendencia, eh, y todos esos soportes pues, han sido eh, identificados por algunos bancos centrales a nivel global, eh, también sus, sus principios fueron eh, tomados por parte de los bancos centrales de Nueva Zelanda, Suecia, Reino Unido, para implementar, implementar eh, política económica eh, independiente del, del gobierno. Pues sin más, entonces dejo eh, y abro la, la sesión para el profesor Edward Prescott. Muchas gracias. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> In economics, we've learned so much, but a lot of this we've learned recently. It is not diffused. Today it will, to an important audience. The points I want to make, most of the world economies are doing well. Exceptions, the United States and Southern Europe. Uh, Italy and Spain are, not, are pretty big countries, population-wise, and are not doing that well. 
course, there's also Portugal and Greece. Um, so I looked at the uh, South American countries that are on the uh, Pacific coast. Over the last 10 years, you're going to find out that they've been doing well. And they have narrowed the gap with the leader. They've been doing significant catch-up. But even Africa is uh, becoming more stable and is beginning to catch up, though it's a long ways to go. I'm going to be arguing, I examined the data and used theory, and the finding is that the uh, the economic problems are not due to financial crises, at least not directly. Financial crises are symptoms, not causes, of the current depressed state of the U.S. and the EU economies. <clears throat> By the way, I'm going to be pretty optimistic about the set of countries that I mentioned and that the performance of South America. Um, it's not a spectacular catch-up as occurring in Asia. <clears throat> now the question, why am I optimistic about it? You just look at the Colombian people. <laughs> and the pr and when we'll see some of the other uh, South American states. Um, <clears throat> These countries are becoming more integrated with each other and with the rest of the world. And by the way, these savings for retirement is a crucial, doing that well is crucial for economic prosperity. All are getting richer and catch up is occurring. I just look at the, uh, some simple statistics. I percent of the world population by income group. It's roughly a factor of two between each of the groups. As you can see, <clears throat> the high median income countries, large increase in the frac number, the blue line. As you can see, for the median, a huge increase. So when some country like China moves into the median, <laughs> there's 1.3 billion people. So it makes a big difference. <clears throat> um, things since 1980 has been changed a lot in the incomes are coming across countries are, are coming closer together in the coming closer together are the poorer countries coming up not the <laughs> with a minor exception recently not the rich companies coming down. <clears throat> and I forecast by the end of the uh, century, this century, the whole world will be rich, and a lot richer than U.S. and Western Europe and Japan are now. <clears throat> we look at the 10 percent tile income. It, it's about in this 40-year period, tripling plus. You look at the 50th percentile, nearly a factor of five. Look at the 90th percentile, well, less than a factor of two. It's a little bit over a factor of two. But that now, let's look at the, uh, some of these countries you know a lot about. North America over the last Decade, I picked decade because you get bigger numbers. Um, this is a total decade growth. <clears throat> if you do annualize things, the numbers, you have to do a lot of compounding in your head, and this is easier to look at. North America, thank you. Uh, North America, not doing so uh, well. 
there appears to be some change in Mexico. Let's go to uh, some South American countries. Uh, <clears throat> well, Brazil had a pretty good decade. <clears throat> Chile, Colombia, and Ecuador, in terms of growth, amount of growth, a little bit better. What happened in Peru? <laughs> That's pretty spectacular. Um, Peru must have followed the advice of DeSoto and God made it easier for businesses to start up and prosper. Um, the book, that book by DeSoto, The Other Path, had a major influence on t my research. It directed my research for 15 years. <clears throat> Venezuela, not so good. And I'm not so certain how good these statistics are. I think perhaps the problem in Venezuela is uh, the government leave, arrangement leaves something to be desired. Um, <clears throat> but let's look at the U.S. Sometimes it's good to look at the long run and not worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. With the set up a pension system, you want to set up a good system which will serve society, not for the next five years, not for the next ten years, but for the next century or maybe even forever. The first is the long term and the second is the uh, recent picture. This is about 2% um, growth. The precise number you get is which purchasing power parity prices you use. With purchasing power parity, you use a common set of world prices to measure these things. <clears throat> um, there was a Great Depression. All this was for the uh, guns and tanks and planes and stuff in uh, Europe. Uh, it wasn't private consumption. During World War II, you couldn't get any, couldn't buy a car, a new car. They didn't produce any. You couldn't buy a new house. They didn't produce any, except a few around new defense establishments. <clears throat> but now let's look recent. This is at the end of that picture. As you can see, this is the pre-2008 the or 2008 trend. And the U.S. was growing at trend. A lot of foreigners were, the, a mil, every year a million p increase in the number of foreign-born workers. Um, they try to measure illegal immigrants and I think they know the legal and they know the foreign born and they take, take the difference. But then notice that this, this is a log scale, so this is about 10%. And by the way, the latest number was only 2% that just came out, I saw yesterday. Things have not turned around in the U.S. I would, relative to trend, there is no recovery. Anytime prosperity and depression are relative concepts. The U.S. is 40% more prosperous than Europe, or Europe is depressed 30% relative to the United States. Um, I'm a little puzzled why things don't, I would call recovery when this thing starts going back up to the old trend. Unless this is a permanent state of affairs, or maybe a little bit like Japan who lost a decade of growth between 1992 and 2002 uh, before they made reforms and set up a sound financial system. Um, <clears throat> and cut down on the subsidizing inefficient producers.
One of the numbers you can get fast, the GDP numbers come in so slow, and they get revised a lot. Why? New sense, new data. The census come in every five years, and a couple years after that, these are censuses of uh, businesses. The censuses of the population, households, is every 10 years. But as you can see, uh, a big drop. And then the amount of people working per working age person. So I don't want to count. In the 90s, I said Japan did terribly. U.S. and Western Europe did well, equally well on a per person basis. U.S. grew faster because population increased more, not because of living standards increasing faster. Um, now I want to turn more to finance. You, you, you people are the experts in finance, and I've been working intensely in this area for, uh, I guess I really started back in 2000 on this. Uh, Greenspan was talking about your rational exuberance, and I was at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve. And we had to fill up a, a quarterly publication, so we sat down there and started looking at that from the perspective of economic theory. And some interesting things emerged. Um, these are GMPs. GMP is $15 trillion in the U.S. So that's nearly seven times 15 is like $100 trillion. These are big numbers. Of these tangible assets, mostly real estate, but also some consumer durables, I listed government debt as an asset. Um, I don't include the part that's in the, uh, this number's gone up a bit since then. And it's pushing close to one. I include the state and local government here. Private debt is, uh, is a big number, 2.5 GNPs. Most of this private debt is between households within the U.S. I'm going to abstract from the foreign sector because that roughly balances. Um, and if you, you'll not be making a big error. For a smaller country, that can be a big factor. Um, some countries like have huge investments abroad, Switzerland, for example. Now, total liabilities. Um, 2.51. This is what households lent to other households, and this is what households have borrowed from others. Most of it is intermediated and sometimes through a complex chain. Um, notice these two numbers have to be equal. For each borrower, a lender there must be. Everybody cannot save more by lending and reducing their debt. Because if they lend more, somebody else has to borrow more and go the other direction. When you come to government in these overlapping generation models, it's a different story. Some of you may have had some training at Harvard and worked with uh, Bob Barrow. Um, with these dynastic family models, government debt is not part of wealth, but with the overlapping generation, which the empirical evidence is supporting, the studies that have been coming in, a number of them, in, over the last 10 years, seem to say that that's a better abstraction than the one you need to use for addressing this. For business cycle, it doesn't matter which one you use. Real role. Uh, Victor Jose Rios Roll has shown that. <clears throat> so, net worth of the household sector, the private sector. You know, we pass back, if you own a corporation, 1% uh, of a corporation, I, we say you own 1% of their capital, 
tangible capital and, one, and have 1% 1 of their liabilities. Um, so this just moves every, because people, corporations are not people. You, a lot of people say tax those awful banks. Banks are not people, it's the owners. Um, The make you know cooper corporations are a cooperative group of people getting together. Sometimes there's agency problem within there, and uh, maybe some people get a little greedy and uh, <laughs> who are in the agency position, not greedy, but are able to take more than excessive amounts. Now, the private sector's equity, net worth, less government debt, is only 3.8 GMPs. While the stock of private capital, including intangible capital, is 5.1. I emphasize private. The government has another about 0.6 GMPs of capital. This includes land, inventory, consumer durables, as well as corporations. Um, the value of corporations are about 1.2 or 1.3 GMPs now. At the peak in 2000, and it was about 1.7. But this discrepancy between this 5.1 and 3.8 is big. Why is the value of businesses less than the value of their assets, net assets, net of liabilities? Um, I will be answering that question shortly. The answer. The market value of private capital is less than the stock because of taxes and regulation. De facto, the government owns a big chunk of uh, private capital. If you have a fruit tree that bears huge amounts of uh, or let's make it oil. You have a lot of oil here. And suppose the government takes 90% of the profits. They're 90% owners. <laughs> and the value of that asset will be is much small. It would be 10 times bigger if they took none. Um, there's a big difference between, well, when you take that intertemporal budget constraint of David Ricardo seriously, you learn a lot. This will be the only equations. The value of uh, private businesses. One minus the tax rate on distributions, which were, until the early 80s, virtually all in the form of dividends in the US. Now they're about 50-50 between dividends and buybacks. Time T is tangible capital. The things you got capitalized, the prime means it's end of period. Um, or beginning of next. <clears throat> the fact that the government takes on tax and distribution is 50%, then they're 50% owners. The, the, Dividend tax rate in the 60s was up around 47% in the United States. This is the average marginal. You can get that straight out of uh, IRS statistic of income data. Now it's more like 15%. Why? Pension funds. <laughs> Deferred compensation. Um, And a little bit was due to the Reagan tax cuts. And, and some more was due to uh, Bush reducing the tax rate on capital gains and dividends to 15%. This assumes all investment financed by retained earnings. By the way, I is intangible capital. This capital stock in the is as big as that capital stock. We're talking numbers like 1.2 GMPs. No, I'm sorry, 1.7 GMPs, and this is maybe even a little bit smaller. But the corporate profit tax is about 
counting state and federal in the U.S. is 40 percent. And you count this factor, effectively the government's paying half the cost of uh, intangible investment by letting businesses expense it. And they're getting half the return. They're half owners. So that part does not show up in the private value on the balance sheets of the private sector. Because they, they measure those capital stocks directly, that's in the national accounts, and then you look at the market values, where they go out and sample the market of businesses and houses, well, what's a owner-occupied housing except a household business that rents the house to itself? That's the way the national accountants treat that. Let's look at the regional. A number of years, about five years ago, I gave this plenary lecture at the, uh, I think it was the World Bank. It was the World Bank. Um, and, and sort of what happened, oh, there's a relatively little difference back in 1800. Netherlands and uh, Indonesia. Indonesia was the colony of uh, the ne Netherlands. Same income. Um, but over time, the West started modern economic growth where living standards doubled every 35 years. We'll call 35 years a generation. That's nearly a factor of seven per century. Um, back in about 1875, Latin America was about a quarter, and there's still a quarter. Um, so, we're going to see some favorable movements at the end. In, in my forecast, of up, up, up for them, for you people. By the way, Asia has already caught up to Latin America. It may have... Remember, there's lots of Chinese, 1.3 billion. Now, why do I be so optimistic on South America? Why do I forecast that you will f catch up in this century? You have a good pension financing of uh, retirement that channels savings to productive investments in efficient ways that doesn't use excessive amount of resources. I find this example of Chile very, they set, they were one of the leaders in setting up individual savings accounts in the early 1980s. Chile uses these savings to acquire American retailers in Chile, um, in Chile. And these acquired retailers, Chilean companies now, uh, enhance the know-how of these business enterprises. And they're big in Argentina, and uh, I don't know, in Colombia <laughs> as well, I just learned. Uh, they did this. These investments turned out to be good ones on average, which is good for Chilean savers, which is great for the people in the countries where they invested. And by the way, when the local people retailers have competition from abroad, they get better. Why is Latin America so good as, at football? They have a lot of competition. <laughs> and you need good competition to be good. Advice. Invest in neighboring countries as well as your own. It's good for your people to have an equity position in your country. Don't write off North America, Western and Central Europe, and Asia as places to make direct foreign investment. Uh, recently I was in Brazil and learned that they had made a number of sizable foreign direct, direct foreign investments, their multinationals, in China. If you look at the steel industry in the U.S., a lot of those firms are Brazilian. The beer firms, they're uh, Mexican. <laughs> and cement. The 
This know-how can be used in multiple locations, and openness has a great advantage there. Um, it increases the amount of output you can get with the same amount of resources in the world. It looks like increasing returns to scale. From a mathematical technical point of view, it's not. There's a separating hyperplane in the invisible hand works of Aero de Bruin. Adam Smith. One of the pioneers in defined benefit contribution plans were American academics. Andrew Carnegie in 1917 set up something called TIAA, Teachers Annuity, I don't know, Assurance Association or something of that sort. That has done well over the subsequent period, including the Great Depression. Um, um, now, people in the private business sector, you know, th 30 years ago they didn't, now they do, mostly in defined contribution plans. Um, some laws were changed in August of uh, 2007 that made it permitted cash portable options and some technical things that you people know much more about than I. Um, but this facilitated, it was not called age discrimination against old people like myself. <laughs> um, it's a lot fairer system to the young people like most of the people here. Um, the only important exception remaining in the U.S. is uh, state and local government employees and a few highly regulated ones. Uh, United Automobile Workers that work for GM, Chrysler, and, and Ford, but they're part of the ruling. Well, uh, but even there, some reforms are being made. GM shifted away from the defined benefits for its non-labor workers, which is nearly half the workforce, recently. Already for the state level, Michigan, Alaska, and Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is not a state, but it's, it's a district. Um, have shifted to defined contribution plans. You know, in the U.S., they talk about those few people that own all the stock. But who owns the stock? Pension funds and individual retirement accounts own about 75% of the U.S. stock market. Well, they own some foreign and some foreigners own theirs. Um, they're the ones that have the uh, vested uh, interest. A lot of sole proprietors and small businesses are invested in their own company. If they set up their Schedule S Corporation, which is really a limited liability partnership, um, everything gets passed to the owners and they pay tax like ordinary income. Um, they're locked into that. By the way, with the Schedule S Corporation to get the dividends, you've got to work for the company. If you own 10% and you don't work for it, you get nothing. <laughs> um, this is just not owned by a few rich people. There's a few rich institutions, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and Stanford that have their 40 or 35 billion dollar uh, endowments, most of which are in stocks. Um, but when you add up all these non-profit institutions, it's not a huge percent. And I just combine them with the household sector. Now let's turn to this euro crisis. Have you sold all your euros? The euro went up a little bit relative to the dollar today. Why? I don't know. 
Uh, this crisis is the result of demographic changes. It seems to be that um, there is a shortage of needed savings opportunities. The fraction of the population that are retired, or the number of workers per retiree has fallen significantly in Europe, from about three down to two, and it's going down further. I just saw something that said in Japan it's going down to one. Um, people are having longer retirement pe periods. They're living longer, so they have to save more. We've got to make those people work more. The Swedes have done something. They've indexed. They have mandatory savings in individual savings accounts. Um, the Swedes have indexed their retirement age to the actuarial tables. By the way, uh, everybody says, oh, the, the Germans are so great uh, and physically, physically responsible. Well, they should not have been lending to the Greeks. Uh, why would, did they lend? They knew that they were going their state probably told them to do it, the banks to do it. Why? They want to have savings opportunities for their old people who vote. Um, but you shouldn't make promises you can't honor. Um, sometimes politicians put off to the next generation of politicians the problems. In these state and local defined benefit schemes, they're, they have mandatory returns and they make what I call an incredible assumption of 8% real return on these savings. I think a more reasonable number may be 4.5% uh, real. What should Europe do? Tom Sargent, in his 2012 Nobel Prize address, points out that the U.S. did not bail out the member states in the 1840s. They all went bankrupt. A lot of the states went bankrupt. And every one, except for one, put in a balanced budget amendment to their constitutions. Um, <clears throat> there was no collapse of output and employment associated with this failure to ba bail out. Um, so what do I say? Let Greece go bankrupt. Somebody's going to lose. I think they're trying to hide the, t the losses so that people don't understand what's going on. I like transparent systems. By the way, I don't think the U.S. should bail out California and Illinois. California's going crazy with the... And Illinois is raiding the pension funds. They used to be well-funded. It won't be long before CalPER, that's the California Reti Public Retirement Plan, the biggest stockholder in the world. Will they be rating them? <laughs> Hope not. What Europe should do is incentives needed to change so that people work a larger fraction of their lifetimes. The French work 30% less than the Americans. Half of that is the fraction of their lifetime worked. Half of that is the uh, hours worked per working person. In the prime age, the work employment rates are the same. They work 40 weeks a year. U.S. it's 46. They get five weeks of vacation. U.S. you get two. They have more sick days. They have more holidays. A sick, one sick day is one fifth of a week not working in, my calc in these calculations. But some reforms are being made. They've been up some of the retirement. They're up to 67 in uh, Germany. The U.S. is at 66 currently and is scheduled to march up. This is part of the 1983 Greenspan reform when he was the head of that commission. Um, where they cut dramatically Social Security benefits by getting rid of double indexing, um, 
phasing in these increases in the full retirement age that will occur? I don't know, 15 and 20 years hence. Um, and also started taxing the benefits. You really should not look at the total benefits. You should look at the benefits net of the taxes you pay on those benefits. By the way, tax rates in Scandinavia are not as high as they normally say. They tax, they have a broad-based tax system. They tax all the transfers. Uh, and they have a pretty flat tax schedule. They just have basically two brackets. <clears throat> Recently, France had a 33. France has a 33 percent Social Security tax. That's big. Is that big? Probably bigger than Colombia. Uh, but they said if you reach full retirement age and continue to work, you don't have to pay that tax. That's a bit in in retirement age. It started to go up a bit in Europe. The Italians have programmed 11 percent of their GMP for retirement. Uh, it's only about four percent here uh, in, and in the U.S. But they're starting to not let people retire at 50, but there's these Poland's trying like mad to get the people to they inherited a system from the the communist era, and they work a small fraction of their lifetime and retire early. But they work more hours per year, the workers, than Americans. They work 2,000 hours, 50 weeks, 40 hours. U.S. it's 1,800. Netherlands it's 1,400. France about 1,550. Um, Exactly why that is is an interesting question that I don't, and I hope some bright graduate student will sort of sort all that stuff out. As I mentioned, life expectancy increasing. This will mean more savings, more business for you. Columbia should follow policies that result in a larger formal market sector. That will increase revenue and increased productivity, lowering its minimum wage. I think it's a little bit high here. And tax reforms are being designed for this country and they should be designed in such a way that um, marginal tax rates are down. And that's generally better to broaden the base. In my community, we were recently forecast, forced to uh, buy, to form a fire dis district and ha paid for it through taxes. That means we all the, I'm one of the poor people in the neighborhood, and we have to, why, that means we can deduct those tax payments on the, uh, our in federal income tax and state income tax are not, um, because state and local taxes are deductible in the federal. I don't think it's a good system, by the way. I don't think they should be. Make it easy to start up, expand businesses. And if some business doesn't work out, make it easy to contract. It's just about impossible to do that in Portugal and Spain and Italy. By the way, there is one problem with annuities that's dangerous. Mortality rates could fall significantly. And if there's promised benefits, that could make some of the uh, insurance companies, annuity providers, insolvent. I, the solution is to design better instruments where there's more sharing. Have the current payout of pension funds be contingent upon life expectancy expectancy for an age cohort. They decide how much to pull out of those still living uh, each year. 
a good way to save for retirement. Well, I've explored different approaches, annuities which are not free. A couple percent of is used up, but they provide insurance which is very valuable about outliving your savings, not outliving your savings. Um, another way is to just save directly and get higher returns. Um, if you do, you get probably get about 5% real. If you have an independent business person, you're probably even higher. There's a lot of hidden income on people that run their own businesses. Uh, where is it you... There's some things that are... Uh, Well, in the U.S. national councils, they tack on 5% of GNP onto the proprietor's income for income that's not reported. Uh, you go to Italy, it's 25%. For Colombia, what is it? Uh, <laughs> Peru? <laughs> you may even be better than the Italians. I don't know. By the way, with this saving strategy, there will be accidental bequests because you save based upon an optimistic, high, highly optimistic assumption about how long you live. If you have an accidental bequest, well, and you have children, they will probably won't mind receiving a little bit of funds. On the other hand, when you're an old person, and you have, even if you don't have children, you know what those people from the uh, Arizona State University come out there and say, don't you want to contribute to this fund or that fund? And they give these old people attention. And when you get old, you need that attention. You know what? It's very predictable. Every year you'll get one year older. You can't insure against that. I say stock market is the safe place to save. It's the safest place to save, even though the stock market is so volatile. Um, there is a strong regression to fundamentals, that equation I showed you. Expect an average real return of 5% in the stock market. Um, that seems to stay pretty constant. You look at the capital earnings uh, from the national account, after tax, and depreciation, of course, net earnings, and divide by the capital stock, and you get around 4.2, but then there's some adjustments that make it closer to 5. The debt gets less, but debt has some, well, if it's indexed debt, it's, it's, it's safe, but, it's, but I can't see the, the uh, Interest rates going much lower, uh, which would result in the capital gains and holding of bonds. An important fact, everybody cannot increase their savings by lending more and borrowing less. Private sector borrowing and lending must be equal. What I say to Col uh, Colombian neighboring countries, create a good business environment which fosters the creation of new business enterprises. A good system has workers moving quickly from where they're less productive to where they're more productive. Remember the identity. Income equals outcome. What is income? Income is claims against output. And there's always a residual claimant. So it has to hold. Uh, income is by definition, I had said that already. Output increases are the result of two things. Make it on per person basis. How much people work per person? How many hours? And how much output they produce per hour? Uh, output and productivity. I probably should go to total factor productivity, but human capital is the most important input. That has claimed us over 70% of output. The U.S. subprime crisis, U.S. de facto nationalized its mortgage market. And not surprisingly, bad policies were followed. That there's a lot of political pressure. What did Frank say back in 2002 when they started worrying about the subprime? 
roll the dice. Home ownership was so important. What they do with this uh, savings and loan, which went bankrupt, well, in fact, it became insolvent in the late 70s and went bankrupt about 1989. That was to foster home ownership. They even have laws that say banks have to make these subprime mortgage loans. You have to invest locally, and some of these local areas didn't have any profitable investment. Local, they didn't have the qualified local borrowers. Um, and there's these quasi-government enterprises. They call them government-sponsored enterprises. Uh, they're quasi-public. Fannie Mae and Fannie Mac. They guaranteed a big share of home mortgages as well as, uh, well, there's lots of other letters in that. Other groups that do it. There's another group that does it as well. They had to be bailed out by the taxpayers. Um, I mentioned this about the uh, foreign sector earlier in the talk. So probably inappropriate to repeat. To conclude, Pacific South American economies should be open and compete across borders, develop a broad-based private ownership economy, define contribution, foster defined contribution pension plans, as is being done. Don't subsidize inefficient producers. Why did Chile come roaring back from its 1981 crisis when all the banks went bankrupt. They set up a sound banking system, they set up savings plans, and what they do in Mexico? They're hit by the same shocks. They had foreign debt denoted in U.S. dollars and the interest rate went from about, real interest rate from about minus 5% to plus 10% real. Um, but Mexico sub sub used the banking system to finance, subsidize inefficiencies. For each job they saved, it cost them two. Um, and they lost a decade and a half of growth. Well, I'd like to thank you for your attention and if there's time, hear your comments, criticism, and